Welcome back to the Rifamonas Reproducible Research Tutorial Series. Today's tutorial is called Working on a High Performance Computer. We're going to talk about using cloud computing to enhance the reproducibility of your workflow as well as to help analyze large data sets that can't easily be analyzed on your own personal computer. The material in today's tutorial isn't super critical to making your research more re reproducible. However, I still think that you'll see the value as part of an overall effort towards greater reproducibility. Furthermore, as data sets get larger, I think it's worth knowing how to use high performance computers at your own institution or using services like Amazon Web Services, or AWS for short, to analyze these large data sets. If your local institution has their own high performance computer cluster, then it'll probably also have its own idiosyncrasies of how to log in, how to load packages, how to move files around. So if you go through these slides with me, you'll notice that I'll skip some. And those that I'm skipping are the basics on how to use a cluster here at the University of Michigan called Flux. But because the idiosyncrasies of Flux and other clusters are not universal, I'll instead focus on working with the AWS cloud computing tools. The systems administrators at your local cluster likely have training materials that you can use to get going quickly. We're going to use AWS for the remainder of this tutorial series. It's not free, but it's pretty cheap. And if you follow along with me over the rest of the tutorials, you'll find that it maybe only costs you a few bucks. So now join me in opening the slides for today's tutorial series, which you can find within the Reproducible Research Tutorial at the Rifamonas.org website. Before we go into today's tutorial on working with high performance computers, I'd like to give you all a little test to see how much you remember of the previous discussion we had on Markdown. On this slide, you'll see a list of the top five songs from Casey Kasem's Top 40 Year-End Countdown for the year 1976. Using Markdown, convert this list to an ordered list and italicize the song name. Go ahead and hit pause while you work on this exercise, and when you press play again, I'll show you the answers. Here is how I would have done it. So first you'll see to make it an ordered list, I put the number one with a period at the beginning of each line. Alternatively, you could have numbered them one, two, three, four, five. The advantage of using all ones like this is if I wanted to add something between Don't Go Breaking My Heart and Disco Lady, it would automatically update the numbering for the now six different lines of the list. In addition, to italicize the song names, I could put a single asterisk at the beginning and end of the song names. If I had perhaps wanted to bold Paul McCartney, I could put two stars around Paul McCartney's name to make it bold. So if this doesn't seem super familiar to you, go ahead and go back and listen to the previous talk where we introduced the concept of Markdown. This will be a very useful tool in the coming tutorials where we talk about documentation. The learning goals for today's tutorial are to identify the practical and financial benefits of using high-performance computers, or HPCs, over a local computer. We'll access an HPC resources on Amazon Web Services. We'll see how you can run jobs and do analyses using a program called TMUX. And then we'll see how we can move files between a local computer and AWS, and then back to your local computer. I'm not going to discuss this as I introduced in the, uh, in the introduction to this tutorial, but the slide deck here also contains information on how to work with a local high-performance computer cluster. Again, because of the idiosyncrasies of various HPCs from different institutions, I figured it's kind of a fool's errand to try to serve everybody. And so we'll really be focusing on information about how to work with AWS. So one of the most frequently asked questions that I'm asked when I teach workshops or when um, people are starting to learn to use Mother or, or any other type of bioinformatics tools uh, drives me nuts. And they ask me, what type of computer should I get? And I hate this question because I don't really want to spend other people's money. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, I, I, I think a, a computer is a very, very personal thing, that it's probably the one piece of equipment, lab equipment, 
that I use more than anything else. Um, so it's something I want to be comfortable using and like and enjoy the experience of. I also do see it as a piece of lab equipment, right? That this is a lot like a thermocycler or a pipetter uh, that you might use in the lab. Well, my lab is my desk here in my office, and so it's important to me that I have a computer and a setup that I like. But beyond that, I don't really know what to tell you. <laughs> um, some people like Mac, some like Windows, some like Linux. Um, and, and so I always get a little bit uncomfortable because I don't want to be seen as taking sides. And also computers can get really expensive and people want to try to price things out for hardware. And so some of the questions I ask people to think about are, you know, what are you going to use it for? Um, are you only going to be doing word processing? Or are you going to be doing coding and analysis? Or perhaps without your PI watching, are you going to be using it to play games or watch movies? You know, what is your budget? How much RAM do you need? How much CPU speed? How many CPUs do you need? How much hard drive space do you need? What operating system do you want to use? And then what does your lab use? Right? So it's, as a PI, it can be frustrating when everybody's using a different operating system and it's really difficult to, um, to get everybody on the same page because sometimes there's a lot of conflicts between, say, Windows and Mac users in terms of the types of files they use. Okay? And so these are all really relevant and really important questions. Um, maybe I can answer for people how much RAM or CPUs uh, speed or number that they need. Um, but even that's going to change as the size of their data sets are going to change. Okay, So a lot of these questions are personal and things that I, I really can't answer. And so some of the problems with modern computers is that they get old quick. right? So uh, by the time you buy a computer, it, it might be obsolete already. They also sit idle a lot. I know my computer is open when I'm at work, and the rest of the day it's closed and uh, on my desk or in my backpack. It's not getting used. Um, they can also be quite expensive. You know, if you get a top-of-the-line MacBook Pro that's got all the bells and whistles, that's going to be pretty expensive. Alternatively, they can also be ridiculously cheap. Uh, you can get a Chromebook um, for a couple hundred bucks. So it's hard to predict um, also what you're going to be using them for, right? So you might get a computer today, and a year from now you uh, decide to go into a different area of research and uh, you might need different features than you'd, you'd previously anticipated. Okay, So um, it, it, it's, a, it's a moving target in terms of what type of hardware and even software that you're going to want to use on your computer. Okay, So these are all the difficulties of working with um, computers and picking out a computer. So here's a quick comparison. Uh, these numbers were valid when I looked them up a month or so ago. Um, looking at kind of top of the line and middle of the line laptops, so a MacBook Pro, a Dell, or a System76 to run Mac, Windows, or Linux. And like I was saying, uh, you can get something that varies considerably in terms of cost, right? And so um, these are different configurations for each of the, the types that vary in price by about twofold, right? So if you get a 15-inch monitor for a Mac with 2.9 gigahertz and 16 gigs of RAM and 500 uh, gigabyte hard drive versus 13-inch, 2.9, 8 gig, 256 hard drive, it's you know, a difference in price of about $1,300, which is a lot of money, right? And so um, it, it's easy um, to, to see how you can spend a lot of money and how you can very quickly get a bit confused um, about what to do. And of course, there are far cheaper laptops than these that are out there too. So in comparison, we might also think about using a high-performance computer cluster rather than doing all of the analysis on our laptop or on a desktop computer. So if you were to use something like AWS, uh, the, the prices here are also frequently changing, that you can get access to a computer with four CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM for about 20 cents an hour. Okay, um, And similarly, you can get bigger and bigger computers through AWS uh, paying different amounts of money. And so one of the things to note about this pricing is that it's by the hour. And so if it sits idle and you put the computer to sleep, you're not paying for it. 
Whereas the computer that sits on my desk or in my backpack closed and not running, I paid for it, right? And so uh, it's only getting older <laughs> um, and it's not getting any cheaper. Um, alternatively, at the University of Michigan, we have a high performance computer cluster called Flux. And I pay about $17 per core per month for a core that's four gigs of RAM per core. Alternatively, I could pay $13 per core per month uh, for a computer with um, uh, 25 gigs of RAM if I buy the whole month. Okay, so on demand means I, I get access to it when it comes available. Usually that only takes a few minutes, um, but there's different pricing systems and different ways to think about uh, the value of your computing. Okay, and there's also other public and commercial computer clusters available. Um, the, the prices also don't include the cost of storage, which is generally pretty cheap. Um, and with AWS, you can also get access to various educational discounts. Uh, related to that also is that the University of Michigan, and I think a lot of other universities that have these HPCs, um, they heavily subsidize the cost of the HPC, and it comes out, I think, to be about half the cost of AWS. So um, there's pluses and minuses of using your, your local HPC relative to Amazon. I don't want to get into those too much here. Um, and, and again, computing isn't free, and so while we'll use AWS for this tutorial series, um, it's not going to be much more than a few bucks uh, to pay for what we're doing in these tutorials. So I encourage you to come along with me in using the Amazon Web Services as we go through this tutorial and the other tutorials in the series. So some of the benefits of using an HPC, uh, the hardware is constantly being updated at no cost to you. I think it's updated perhaps a little bit faster when you're using AWS than your local cluster. Um, with a thousand bucks at AWS, it would last you about 104 days with 100% usage, which I think is unlikely that you would have 100% usage. Um, and, and, and that's also a really nice computer that you'd be using on AWS. Okay. It's pretty flexible. So you might only need eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM for a short period of time in your analysis. Whereas downstream analyses, perhaps using R, where you don't need a lot of RAM, could possibly don't be done for free. And so you can mix and match different needs in your analysis using different costs along the way. Okay. I also think that uh, this will reinforce good reproducible research practices, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. With the availability of an HPC, then, you're perhaps better off thinking of your laptop as a terminal rather than as a workstation or as a workhorse, right? So if you only need to be able to log in to a remote computer, then your laptop doesn't need to have all the bells and whistles. For, I mean, you may want the bells and whistles to watch Netflix and to do other things, um, but you don't need the bells and whistles for doing your data analysis. And I think that's very comforting because as your data sets get larger, or perhaps your research interests change, you're not so invested into a computer to do that work, right? So if your data set doubles or triples in size, well, your computer now might be too small. Well, if you're using it as a terminal to get access to an HPC, that's not such a big deal. Some of the drawbacks of using an HPC is that there, there is a learning curve, and, and hopefully today's tutorial will help us to get over that learning curve. You'll have to learn how to use the command line, which we'll do in a future tutorial. And it, it feels weird at first, right? Like you're working in the cloud and you might wonder, well, where is this computer? Um, I, I have a, I've had in the past a computer at the University of Michigan that was attached to the cloud and I never saw the computer. <laughs> it took me a few months to get used to that. I've, I had no idea physically where this thing was located. Um, and, and that was just fairly unsettling, but eventually you get used to it and you realize that you have access to a really powerful computer um, that, that is relatively inexpensive. So to get to your HPC, if you're working with your local HPC, you're going to need information from your systems administrators. And like I said earlier, they'll have, typically they'll have tutorials for you to follow and information that you can use uh, to get up, up and going quickly. For accessing your local HPC as well as AWS, 
you'll likely use SSH if you're using a Mac or a Linux. SSH comes pre-installed with a Mac and Linux. If you're on Windows, you'll want to download a, com a, a program called PuTTY. And so you can go to these links and download them. Like I said, SSH should already be installed on your Mac or Linux computer, whereas PuTTY you'll have to go out and install. If you're accessing a local HPC, you might also need to get things like uh, a VPN or two-factor authentication to get access. We'll deal with those things when we when we log into AWS. So to introduce AWS, you should realize that the S is for services, and there's, there's many different types of services. They have tools for doing data analysis like we're going to do. They have tools for different types of storage. They have services for databases, for maintaining websites, all sorts of different things. Uh, and it sometimes becomes overwhelming by all the various services they offer. It's widely used. So many commercial applications, uh, websites that you use, are being run off of AWS. They'll do web hosting for you. They also have various educational applications. Um, and as I mentioned, if you, uh, if you go into their portal, you'll find ways to get discounts for educational usage, which we qualify for when we're at a university. The service that we're going to use is the Amazon Electric Compute Cloud, or Amazon EC2. This creates a virtual computing environment that are called instances. So this is an important piece of jargon to tuck away, uh, that these computing environments or remote computers are called instances. And we can build upon existing instances that are called Amazon Machine Images, or AMIs. Elastic and the Elastic Compute Cloud comes from the ability to manipulate the hardware configuration of the instance you're using. So as I mentioned before, you could have an instance that requires tons of RAM. Uh, you could then modify that instance to use very little RAM. And this way then you can adapt your cost to what you're doing. In addition, you can create your own AMI, which is preloaded with all of the software and data that you can share with others. So we're going to get going using AWS, using a tutorial that they have built into their website. And so I'm going to go ahead and leave the full screen mode here of the tutorial and click on this link for the AWS tutorial. So the tutorial that we're going to do on the AWS site is how to launch a Linux virtual machine with Amazon EC2. And as you'll see, this is a tutorial with a handful of steps that will quickly get us connected to an instance and will get us set up um, with credentials to log in, as well as how to terminate our instance and, and quit the, the instance. And this will be very useful for when we want to use our own AMI for the rest of the tutorial series. So the first thing that we need to do is to click sign into the console. This then brings us to a sign in window. If you don't already have an Amazon account and you might first try your Amazon credentials for the main website where you would buy books or movies or um, coffee or um, any other things from Amazon. Um, if, you, if you don't have one of those or if that doesn't work for some reason, go ahead and click to uh, sign in to a different account. Um, and, and then if you can go ahead and click on create a new AWS account and then go ahead and insert your information to create your AWS account. I'm going to go ahead and click on sign into an existing AWS account because I already have an account and this is with my email address and my password. So I'll click sign in and this then brings me to the AWS um, homepage. And so we'll go ahead and click on EC2 and if that's not up here for some reason, you could always type EC2. So virtual servers in the cloud. Okay. And so then um, you might have something similar or different than what I have up here, but go ahead and press launch instance. Okay. 
And so we've launched our instance. We're now at the EC2 launch instance wizard, which will help us to configure and launch our instance. And so what we want is to find the Amazon Linux AMI. So we'll come here and there's our Amazon Linux AMI at the very top. We can click select for that. And then we'll now want to pick our instance type. And they have these instance types of varying combinations of CPU properties, memory, storage, uh, and networking capacity. So you can choose the appropriate configuration for your application. Okay, so what we're going to use is for this tutorial is the t2.micro, which is already clicked. And this is covered under a free tier, so it doesn't cost us anything. So we're going to come back here and see that t2micro is already clicked. And then we're going to click the blue button at the bottom for review and launch. It brings us to this summary page to review our instance launch. And everything here looks right. So we'll go ahead and press the launch button. And then create. it then says on the next screen you'll be asked to choose an existing key pair or to create a new key pair. So a key pair is the way that you can securely access this instance using SSH or PuTTY. And so AWS stores the public part of the key pair, which is just like a house lock. So you download the private part of the key pair, which is just like the key. So when you put the key into the lock, you're granted access. Okay. So we're going to select create a new key pair and give it the name my key pair. So we'll say create new key pair and they wanted us to call it my key pair. Okay. So we called it my key pair and now we're going to click download key pair. And so this then uh, was downloaded and opened And so we want to, as it says, we want to store this in a secure location. Okay, so right now I have it on my desktop, which isn't super secure because sometimes things get deleted from my desktop. And so looking at the instructions here, there's a link for Windows and there's a link for Mac. I'm using a Mac, so I'm going to go ahead and follow these instructions. But if you're using a Windows computer, of course, you should then follow these instructions. So for the Mac, we recommend saving your key pair in the .ssh subdirectory from your home directory. Okay. So we haven't gotten too deep into um, how to use uh, the bash and how to move things around, but um, we'll follow the instructions that they have here. And sometimes people have the key pair stored into their downloads directory. Uh, for me, mine downloaded to my desktop. And so we can type the command mv tilde downloads my key pair dot pem tilde ssh my key pair dot pem. So what I'd tell you to do is go ahead and copy that. Uh, you can then right click to copy and then paste it up here into a terminal window. And I should back up and tell you that the terminal for a Mac is if you click on the finder and go applications and at the bottom there's a directory called utilities and here then there's a program called terminal.app and so that will open that but I use the terminal.app app a lot and so I like to keep it in my, um, my, my dock over here on the left Okay, so I'd encourage you to do that too, just because it's we're going to be using it a lot and it's easier to get access to that way. Again, I told you that mine didn't get stored to downloads. Mine is stored on the desktop. So I'm going to scroll to the left over here and remove downloads and replace that with desktop. Okay. So move desktop my key pair dot pem. And when it was downloaded, it added dot txt to the end of it. So I need to change that to .txt. Um, so move tilde forward slash desktop forward slash my key pair dot pem dot txt. So there's no spaces in there. And then there's a space 
where we, we then have the tilde forward slash dot ssh forward slash my key pair dot pem. Okay, so if I go ahead and hit enter, I can test what happened. Well, first of all, I, I didn't get an error message, and I can type ls space dot ssh, and I see in here my key pair dot pem. So it got moved. Okay, and so that's there. And so now I, it, the, the tutorial tells me that after I have stored my key pair, click Launch Instance to start your Linux instance. Okay. So go ahead and kick, click Launch Instance. It goes through and voila, your instances are now launching. Okay. And so I can go ahead and click on the blue button. Just double check that that's what they want me to do. Yep, and it tells me to click the blue button for view instances. And so it's got this message here, this notifications that I'm not going to worry about. I'll close that. And you'll see that there's a line across the top here for my instance. The instance state is running and it's checking the status is that it's initializing. Okay. Great. So it takes a few moments. Uh, but then the instant state column on your instance will change to running and a public IP address will be shown. Okay, so it's running. And is there a public IP address? Yes, public IP address is right here. This 54196.11.3 or uh, this longer one here. So um, again, if you're using Mac or if you're win using Windows, um, with Windows, they'll have you download a tool called Git for Windows. Um, this is similar to what PuTTY does, or has functions in it that are similar to what PuTTY does. Um, I'll leave the Windows users to follow that. Those of you using Mac Linux, I'll click on that to bring up these instructions. Um, and so it says your Mac or Linux computer most likely includes an SSH client by default, as we already mentioned. So we can check for an SSH client by typing SSH at the command line. So I'll do that, SSH. Aha, so it, it gives me something. I'm not sure what exactly the, all that means, but, but it works, okay? We'll now need to use the chmod command to make sure that our private key is not publicly viewing, viewable by entering the following command. So I'm, I'm not worried about what this means. I'm gonna highlight this text, right click on it to copy, and then over here, I'll right click to paste. Okay. And then I'll hit enter. And I'll never have to worry about this step again. Okay. So again, in the land of using a Mac or Linux computer to access AWS, I can now use SSH. So I can say SSH space dash I space tilde forward slash dot SSH forward slash my key and to show you a nice little trick I can hit once I've started typing this path in I can hit the tab key and it will complete it for me so I don't have to type so much and then I can type ec2 hyphen user at and I'm going to give it this IP address well not this IP address I'm going to give it my IP address which was back here and so I can highlight this one. We'll see if this one works. And I'll do right click copy. And I'll come back up here and do right click paste. And I'll hit enter. Um, let's see, are you sure you want to continue? I'm pretty sure I want to continue, but let's just double check that it doesn't say anything. Aha. Here it says, are you sure you want to continue connecting? Yes or no? So I'm going to say yes. And so it's permanently added it to the list of known hosts. And so now um, I'm in, okay? All right, so I'm gonna scroll down here um, and see what happens. So it, it tells me that I've logged in. Um, if I type LS, there's nothing there, um, but you can rest assured that you are connected to Amazon's computer. So that's pretty cool. It, we got it to work. So for now, we're not gonna do anything in here. Um, 
But what we'd like to do is to show then how we can terminate the instance. Okay? And so if we're not using it, it's a good idea to terminate the instance um, that we're no longer using so we don't get charged for it. And so to quit out of the terminal here, we can type exit. And that leads us to see now that the connection to that IP address is closed. I'm going to go ahead and type exit again to close the terminal shell. And then I can come up here to my EC2 management console and I can right click on it and um, go to instance state and click terminate. And it gives me a warning uh, that it will be deleted once the instance is terminated and any storage on local drives will be lost. Are you sure you want to terminate these instances? Yes, I'm sure. Okay. So now we see it's shutting down. This version, this instance was free, so we're not worried about it, but if this was running a big analysis that had a bunch of stuff stored, um, it, it would be shutting down so we wouldn't be getting charged for it, but at the same time, it would also be deleting everything. So later, we'll see a different way that we can change the instance state to something where it's not terminated, but where it's in a suspended state. Okay. Great. So hopefully that made sense, and hopefully the Windows users were able to follow along in parallel to what we were doing. Um, I think the key differences for those of you using Windows, if we scroll back up here to, um, to step... Um, to, to, to this step up here where we're creating the key pair was saving the key pair to a subdirectory called .ssh underneath your home directory. Um, and like we did for Mac, and then also connecting to the instance with Windows was to do it with a tool called git bash. Okay. And so git bash is part of a tool called git that you've heard me talk about already in this series. Um, but by installing this, um, it, you will then be able to um, run this similar to what we would do um, on a Mac, but instead of using the terminal command, you're going to be using um, you're going to be using git bash to do it. Okay, and so I, I think I mentioned previously possibly using putty. Um, instead of using putty, you could use um, git bash. Okay, if you already know how to use putty, you can also use putty, but um, Git Bash is a nice lightweight tool. It doesn't take up a lot of space, and it's it's the instructions to use it are are here. Okay, so great. We've gone through this tutorial, and it doesn't seem like we did anything, but we really have. By we've created that key pair that allows us to connect securely to AWS. We've seen a list of different types of instances, and we've also connected to an instance. We've made sure that if we're using SSH or Git Bash or Putty, that that works. And so we're really in a good position to go forward now. So I'm going to close this tab from the tutorial. And we'll see now that in our console that that instance has been terminated. So the next thing we're going to do is to create a new instance that we'll be using for the remainder of the tutorial series. It's going to be a little bit more sophisticated and have a lot more to it than that, we, that one we used in the tutorial series. So we can go ahead and click, if we're at this window, Launch Instance. Um, or if you're at the EC2 dashboard, you can then click that blue button to launch a new instance. So we'll go ahead and click this Launch Instance. The first step that it wants us to do is to choose an Amazon machine image. So make sure that uh, this is your name up here. That's me. Make sure that this says N Virginia, North Virginia. And so you'll see there's whole bunch of other versions or locations, but we're going to use the North Virginia location. And then we're going to go to Community AMIs. And so Community AMIs are AMIs, Amazon Machine Images, that were made and contributed by members of the community. And so here I'm going to type in Rifamonas. And you'll see that there are two versions of the Rifamonas AMI here. And so the first is from May of 2017, and the second is November of 2017. And if you're watching this at a later date, uh, later in 2018, you might find a third or fourth version as well. 
So go ahead and pick the latest version. So I'm going to pick this one from November and click Select. And I'm not going to use the micro instance. Instead, I'm going to pick the, um, the general purpose M4 2X large. So scroll down and you'll see M4 2X large. Click on that and we'll see that this has eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. Okay. It's probably more than we need for many of the things that we're doing, but again, it's gonna be a relatively quick analysis over the course of the tutorial and shouldn't take up, uh, shouldn't cost very much. So the next thing we'll do is not click, don't click review and launch, but next to configure the instance details. Click add storage and we want to make sure it says 50 gigabytes. That's good. And now we want to do review and launch. So click that. And we'll see that it says your instance is not eligible for the free usage tier. We know. That's cool. And so we're going to go ahead and click launch. And this pulls up the select an existing key pair or create a new key pair. So here, go ahead and click your key pair, my key pair, click that. And it says, I acknowledge that I have access to the selected private file, mykeypair.pem, and that without this file, I won't be able to log into my instance. So click that. And then I'll go ahead and click launch instances. And my instances are now launching. So I'm gonna go ahead and click view instances. So this other one that we terminated, it may hang out there for a few hours, um, might be for a day or two, but what's, what, what's really important is that it's terminated. So if it says terminated, we don't need to worry about it. Our instance state for this new instance is pending. Okay, so now it says it's running, and I'm gonna go ahead back to my terminal. Now we wanna be able to SSH into our instance. And to do that, the command will be very similar to what we did previously when we did the tutorial um, on the from the Amazon site. We'll type ssh space space dash i space tilde forward slash dash dot <laughs> ssh forward slash my and then I'll hit tab and it'll complete it for me. And then we need a username which for everybody doing the tutorial will be Ubuntu at and then we want to come to our instance window and highlight the IP address right click copy right click paste into our terminal window and hit enter it gives us this question about the authenticity of the host we can say yes it then says that there are some packages that can be updated and some security updates um, that there will be a system restart required so we can do sudo apt upgrade. Um, it then says, do you want to continue? And we'll say Y for yes. It then runs through all this. Great, so it finished installing all that stuff, uh, various security patches and other things that it needed to upgrade to run well. There were a couple points in there where it asked us a couple questions and I just hit enter or Y for each of those and you should do the same. Okay, so at this point we need to restart our instance um, as it told us when we, um, before we went to up update all of those tools. So what we'll do now is we'll type exit from our terminal, which brings us back to our home directory um, on our local computer. And here now, uh, in our instance window, we can now do um, uh, action. Oh, where's the action? Actions up here, actions. And we can then do instance state 
reboot. Okay, so this is clicked, our M42X large instance type. We'll do actions, instance state, reboot. Are you sure you want to reboot these instances? Yes, reboot. And we should be good. So now let's go ahead and log back in. And so see if you can remember. So it's SSH space dash I space tilde forward slash dot SSH forward slash my key pair dot pem Ubuntu at, and then I'm gonna copy this again, paste it in, and we're good to go. You should see that it says zero packages can be updated. Zero updates are security updates, okay? Great, so if we type ls, there's nothing there. Um, one of the things you might type is r, and this will open up the R software package within Amazon. So this is on our Amazon directory, our Amazon instance. Uh, we can quit R by doing Q, open, close parentheses. And so that's great. You'll know that you're on the Amazon instance because in the lower left corner here, it should say Ubuntu, okay? Um, and so you should see a little bit different um, configuration of what things look like in your terminal. So when you're running things remotely on the Amazon server, we might have analyses that take a long time to run. Um, or we might need to, um, and, and so because they're gonna take a long time to run, we don't wanna have to have our computer connected to the internet or running locally for all that time. And so there's a nice tool called Tmux that we can use. Uh, and Tmux is useful for those cases where you've got a log, long job where you might want to disconnect from the internet, right? So say you say it's the end of the day and you want to put your laptop in your backpack to go home, um, but that means then disconnecting from the internet and perhaps disconnecting your Amazon connection. So Tmux allows you to run, to keep those remote jobs running even if your local computer is not running, okay? So while we're in the Amazon instance, you can type tmux, and this will then create a session. And we'll know that this is a tmux session, and again, we are still on Ubuntu, as you see in the upper left corner there. The way you know that it's tmux is that we've got this green band across the bottom of the screen. And so I could type r to load the r program, and you'll see that we're in the r shell. Um, to get out of r, I can then type control B, remove my fingers from control and B and hit D. And that then brings me back to my terminal. To get back to that session, I can then type tmux space A. And that brings me right back to where I was. Okay, so again, to get out of this, we hit control B and then D. And then tmux A gets us back in. Okay, so I could type exit and I'm disconnected from Amazon. If I hit the up arrow, that will bring back the previous command. I can hit enter. And then I can type tmux a, and voila, I'm right back to that session that was still running, even though I wasn't connected to Amazon. Okay, so tmux is really powerful. There's a lot of great other tutorials out there. Um, I'm gonna go control B, D. Uh, one other thing to know is tmux ls and this lists the various tmux uh, sessions that I have going and you'll see this first one is zero so I could do tmux zero to open up that um, that first session okay because I only have one tmux session going um, it doesn't really matter um, it's um, it's gonna take that first one nope. sorry it's tmux a space pound zero Okay, and that brings us right back. So I can then quit this tmux session by quitting out of R, and then from this prompt I can type exit. And that then gets me out of tmux. Okay? So there's a lot of other commands, and there's a lot of other things 
that you can do with Tmux to, um, uh, to run multiple sessions at the same time and to make sure that your analyses won't be ended if you quit Amazon. So if you're going to run something that's going to take a while, be sure you run Tmux before you start those other commands. Okay, so now we're using our own computer that's hosted by Amazon. Okay, we're using Tmux and that allows us to then carry on even if we're not connected to the internet, even if we're asleep or <laughs> wherever. Um, and what we're going to talk about next is how we can use um, a program called FileZilla to connect um, and our local computer to Amazon to move files back and forth. So to install FileZilla, or to use it, we first need to install it. So I'm going to open up a new tab here, go to Google, and type in FileZilla. Um, and it comes up as the top hit, at least on my browser. And you hit that, and then that gives you a couple links um, to download the FileZilla client. And so this is the one we want, download FileZilla client, all platforms knows I'm using a Mac. There's other platforms for Windows and Unix users. So download that. Um, I don't want the pro version. I just need the freebie version. Go ahead and click download. It pulls that down pretty quickly and install it like you would any other piece of software on your computer and follow the instructions. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> you don't need the freebie stuff they're trying to give you, just the FileZilla. And so this now opens up FileZilla, which we can use to work with a remote computer. And so it says the free open source FTP solution. So FTP is a file transfer protocol, um, and it's we've got this nice interface that we can use to access our files from Amazon. So I'll go ahead and click OK to close that. I'm going to clean things up here, get rid of that. Um, drag this over to my trash. Great. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is open our settings. And I'm going to, on a Mac, I can do this under FileZilla settings. And I'm going to click on SFTP. And um, for some reason I've got something here, but it says could not load key file. I'm going to remove that. You probably don't have that. I'm going to then add a key file. So one of the problems with that .ssh file, at least on a Mac, is that Mac hides any file or directory that starts with a period. Okay, So on a Mac, to see those hidden directories or files, I can hold down the command shift period keys all at the same time, and voila, that opens up. Okay, so. Command, command shift period allows me to see those hidden directories. So I'm going to open up .ssh and then I'm going to do mykeypair.pem and I'm going to click open. And that looks right. And so then I can click OK. And then up in the upper left corner, there's this Open the Site Manager. Um, and I'm going to click on that. It's bringing in information from a previous time I used this, I think. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this host information. And over in my console window, um, I'm going to go ahead and copy again my public IP address in there. I'm going to use the SFTP SSH file transfer protocol. I'm going to log on normal, and the username again is Ubuntu. 
I'm not going to put anything in for the password. I think I want to say connect. And so it says status host key is unknown. You have no guarantee that this is the computer you think it is. I'm pretty confident. I'm, I'm going to always trust this host and add this key to the cache. So I'll say OK. And so it's now listing directory listing of home Ubuntu successful. That, that you might have a listing here that has the hidden files. Okay. So to double check that you don't see those, we are going to um, go up to view and go to directory listing filters. Yours probably looks like this. Okay. So we're going to edit filter rules. So I'll say new hidden files and then click OK. What I will then do is to say if the file name contains, well I want that to change to begins with a period and I'm going to filter out items matching all of the following. Okay. And so then I can say OK and then I want to click hidden files and hidden files so that those are no longer seen. Okay. And so then I'm going to click apply and then OK. And if before you had those dot files, those hidden files listed, they should now be missing. Okay. So this looks the way we want it. One other thing that we want to do is go up into settings again. And we want to look at file lists. And the double click action on files should be view edit double click action on directories should be enter directory. So this will allow us to double click on a file and have it open up. So we'll say OK. Great. So now what we'd like to do is to test this out. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize that window and you'll see that I'm, all, I'm still logged into Amazon. If you haven't already logged into Amazon or if you logged out, log back in. And so I'm going to run a, a command that will grab a picture from the internet. Okay, so the command is wget space dash o picture uh, picture dot jpg space https colon forward slash forward slash pick some dot photos forward slash 400 forward slash question mark random. Okay. So this pixum.photos website is a website that creates random pictures. Okay, so I'm gonna just to show you if I highlight that, copy it, um, open up a new tab here, paste that in, um, you'll see that it's a website that allows you to get a lot of different random pictures. Um, if you just need pictures to hold for things. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So anyway, um, clean things up and I can come back to my terminal and hit enter. And you'll see that now I have a picture a file called picture.jpg. But picture.jpg is on the Amazon server. It's not on my local computer. So how do I get that onto my local computer? So we're going to use FileZilla to do that. And what we'll do is hit the refresh button up here. And we now see picture.jpg show up. And so if we double click on that, it will open up a random picture. Pretty cool. So I have a picture of some mountain range and the Milky Way or the stars off in the distance. You have something probably totally different. That's cool. And so that's again, very useful for thinking about um, how we get files down from Amazon. So something else we might do is to um, think about how we would put something into here that we could then put up onto Amazon. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm gonna for fun, go back to that Pixum Photos page. Okay, and um, Oh, I'll just pick, I'll highlight this, 
and then copy that and paste it into my thing and I see um, that pretty picture. I'll save this uh, to my desktop which now shows up over here as 300.jpeg and so I can then drag this into the, the right side of FileZilla and then you'll see it's been added and so now if I come back to my terminal and type ls I now see that I have both 300.jpeg and picture.jpg okay so again it's it's really handy um, to be able to transfer files back and forth so if I were to then delete picture.jpeg do you really want to delete the one file from the server yes and so now if I come over here to my terminal and type ls I now see that picture.jpg is gone. We're, we're at the end of the tutorial, and what I'd like to do now is show you how we can come back to the console without terminating our instance so that it's still there when we open up tomorrow. Okay? So if you want to temporarily quit the session, we'll, cl we'll click on our instance. We can then go up to Actions, and then we can go to State, instant state and then we can say stop okay so before we did terminate and terminate permanently quits the session it will delete everything stop will stop the session it will suspend the session okay and so here it says any data on the ephemeral storage of your instances will be lost so um, we don't have any of that so we're not going to worry so we'll then say yes stop okay and so now that's stopping so note that if we come back later, so this is stopping, um, we'll give it a minute to stop. You can always hit refresh if you're getting antsy, <laughs> like me. And so we now see it's stopped. And so we, if we look down here now, we see that we no longer have an IP address. So if we want to restart this, we can again click on that. Uh, so uh, we could then click Actions, Instant State, Start, and that would fire it back up again. But I'm not going to do that. Um, and then you will also see that our session over here has given an error because we've closed the network connection, right? We stopped the session, okay? But if we do Actions, Instant State, Start, do you want to start these instances? Yes, Start. Now it's running. We now have a new IP address. I can copy that and come back up here and you see that it kicked me out. Um, but if I hit up arrow again, I get back to that long SSH command and I can delete the IP address and paste it in. Hit enter. Again, it doesn't know this address, so I'll say yes. And then if I type ls, we'll see that 300 JPEG is still there, right? So we stopped the instance, but it wasn't running. We're not getting charged for it, okay? So I'll go ahead and type exit, exit again, and we'll come back here, and we will stop this instance. Yes, stop. Awesome. We have used cloud computing to play with some pictures. <laughs> Admittedly, it's a very humble beginning to our use of high-performance computing clustering, but we've already gone over a lot of great material that we will be using in future tutorials of this series. We've been able to connect to Amazon, we've been able to move files around, we've learned about Tmux, and so those are tools, again, that we're going to be using as we go forward with our data analysis. So, as some exercises, what I'd like you to do is to think about how using an HPC can facilitate reproducible research. Um, what would be the strengths and weaknesses of storing a project's analysis as an AMI? Um, from your terminal, um, we, we did this with picture.jpg, but go ahead and log back in, use FileZilla to upload a file um, uh, maybe perhaps download another file like we did with that wget command from um, being logged into the Amazon instance and and do that exchange a couple times where you pull things down to your local computer, push things up to your Amazon remote, 
to show to yourself that you can do this. I hope you enjoyed learning about how to access and work with Amazon EC2 service. There really are a lot of different services available through AWS that you might enjoy learning about for your other projects. They really have a nice set of tutorials available on the AWS website that you can use to learn how to use them. For this series of tutorials, however, we'll only be using the Amazon EC2 service. What do you think? How might we use the Amazon EC2 to improve the reproducibility of our analyses? So I can think of two possible ways uh, where we could use Amazon EC2 to improve reproducibility. First, just as I made a mother AMI that we're using in this tutorial and will continue to use through the rest of the series, we could also make an AMI for our full data analysis. That way, we could share a directory structure, files, and software with anyone. Second, when we're analyzing large data sets, we sometimes will run part of the analysis on one computer and other parts of the analysis on another computer. By having access to an affordable and flexible set of computers like Amazon's EC2, we can access all sorts of hardware configurations without having to move files around. I find that when I have to move files around, they invariably get dropped in the wrong place, or perhaps I use different versions of software on the different computers. Overall, this will hinder the reproducibility of my analyses. We'll come back to using Amazon's EC2 in a couple of sessions, so feel free to revisit the material in this tutorial to get some more practice in. In the next tutorial, we'll discuss various types of documentation that you can use to improve the reproducibility of your analysis.